Hey, good morning, everybody. Why don't you come on in if you're in the back, join us as we find our seats. Hey, I, um, I want to just share a little bit about something that, um, that I was ruminating on this morning in my, in my time of preparation. And um, my hope is that it's, uh, that it's an encouragement to all of us. Um, I think I can safely speak for this whole team up here that we, uh, in our times of worship together as a church family, we absolutely love, 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 love to hear all of your voices and joining us in worship. Um, God delights in hearing our voice. Um, you know, and yes, it's true that God looks on the heart and he sees the heart of man and he sees our, the posture of our heart. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's a little bit ironic, um, for me to say this, but in times personally, when I've been out there in the congregation or at other churches or participated in other worship services, I've occasionally, you know, fell silent in with my voice thinking, you know, I'm, I'm worshiping in my heart. But I'm remind, reminded this morning that there's power in using our voice. There's power in singing yeah. our praise and projecting that. I did a quick little search, and in, in th- there's so many scriptures where, um, that encourage us to use our voices. Uh, in Psalms, it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Come into his presence with singing. And it says, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. In Romans, with one mind and one voice, glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Isaiah, the Lord has urged us to use our voices to cry aloud. Spare not, lift up our voices like a trumpet. Again in Psalms, I raise my voice in praise to tell of all the miracles that he's done. So I encourage us this morning... Let's join our voices together in singing our praise. Amen? Amen. Let's make a glorious and joyful noise unto the Lord together. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Yes, we do. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He hung up on that cross. He rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. 
There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Yes, we do. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Amen. We praise your name together this morning, Lord. Hey, um, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says this. All glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Aren't we glad of that? That is an amazing promise. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever. Let's glorify him together this morning, church. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll continue our worship. God is able, He will never fail. He is Almighty God, greater than all we seek, greater than all we ask. He has done great things, lifted up, He defeated the grave. Praise to life, our God is able. Come for the 
Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness so much lord so many times i can look back in my own life and i know it's the same story for all of us here lord we can look back and just see so many times your hand on our lives protecting us guiding us directing us and even in times when we didn't know you were there lord we just thank you that you are so 
so faithful that you never give up on us. You never stop pursuing us, Lord. We just thank you. We bless your name. Praise you, Lord. Praise you. We praise your name.
trust is in you. Thank you, Lord, that there is no one else worthy of that, no one else that we can place all of our trust in. For you are worthy. You have proven yourself over and over, Lord. Lord, teach us to truly abide in you, to know what that truly means daily, Lord, every morning that we get up, we wake up, we take our breath, we open our eyes, and we declare that we belong to you and we abide in you and you in us, Lord. We thank you for that. You're the way, the truth, and the light. You're the well that never runs dry.
Yes, holy are you, Lord. The lamb that was slain. Worthy of all, all our praise. Yes. Worthy of glory. You are worthy, Lord. We bless your name. Thank you for your presence here this morning. So sweet to be in your presence. We praise you. Thank you, Lord, for your greatness. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness that knows no bounds. Thank you, Lord, that you are eternal, that your presence with us never fails, that you are with us in all circumstances. You have said, Lord, that by your stripes we are healed. We call upon you, Lord, for all of those who need healing. Whether that be physical or mental or emotional or spiritual, that your Holy Spirit would go out in a mighty way and bring healing to us, Lord. So we are your people. And we worship you and we adore you. And we declare that you are worthy of our praise. And when we put on the armor, Lord, we are putting on you, Lord Jesus. You are our helmet of salvation. You are our breastplate of righteousness. Yes. You are our belt of truth. Yes. You are the sword of the spirit. And you are our shoes of peace. Be lifted high, Lord. Be glorified. We love you, Jesus. If you have a prayer on your heart, speak it out this morning. Lord, we cry, holy. We lift up William to you right now, Lord, and we pray for your healing presence and your peace on him and on the family, Father God. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family and friends. Please listen. You are dearly, preciously, fiercely, tenaciously, perfectly loved by God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. You have been our dwelling place in all generations. You know what that means? This is one of the 
meanings. He's the only reliable escape from this war zone. The only reliable escape from this war zone. One of the scriptures that we're talking about today, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of God? Sanctuary where God resides. Your body, my body, because we have received the only acceptable sacrifice for our sins, which also provides us the gifting of being placed in a favorable position with God. I am a sanctuary and you are a sanctuary where God resides. This does not just speak to our individual condition, that we get to learn, to enjoy and relax into, but that speaks to the reality for our very purpose for living. Wherever I go and wherever you go, we are sanctuaries where people can find respite, where people can find replenishment, where people can find recovery, where people can find correction, where people can find encouragement, where people can experience the reality that God is intended for those that he created. No matter how bad our circumstances are this day, and we're all in different places. I know I say it a lot, but it's absolutely true. We are incredibly blessed people if we are joined to God in one spirit with him through Christ. So. Before we have announcements and get to have an opportunity to catch up with one of our missionary families through a, a video clip, get up and enjoy each other's company for a minute and remind one another that you're a sanctuary, all right? <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. Good to see you. Make sure that.
Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now put your cute little cabooses in a cushion. You all come back now, you hear? So, all right, do me a favor and open up your bulletins. Ha ha, we don't have any this morning. You know, normally people don't read them, so we just decided to cut out the middle man. No, we, we, had, uh, we had some technological issues this morning, so uh, we are going bulletin list, so I will make an attempt to remember whatever I need to remember, and if I don't, well, then it is what it is. So if anybody else in here has something to announce, then, of course, uh, please make that announcement, unless it's weird, immoral, or unethical, okay? So... Uh, this Friday, the 26th, I've already ordered the tri-tip. John at Marval gave me an awesome price, $3.99 a pound trimmed. And I don't normally do commercials. I'm just excited that I got tri-tip, really, really cheap. So we'll do tri-tip and some big hot dogs, and we're going to watch the movie The Blind, which is the story of it's Phil Robertson's testimony. I think we're meeting here around 6 o'clock, so... Uh, you guys that are coming, if you want to bring side dishes, and if you're going to bring a side dish, instead of asking your wife to make one, just go to Marval or Costco and buy a potato salad or a macaroni salad or, or a green salad or something like that, because you guys know that with men, it's not quality, it's quantity, so that's, that's what the deal is. So that's happening. Also, uh, yesterday, thank you for um, the group of folks that were here yesterday. We got about half the new playground structure up, which means, which is awesome. It means, though, that if, I, I don't think the kids are even in here now. I think they've been taken out. So it, it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment day for them. You know, back in the 70s and 80s when I grew up, you know, before there was you know, lawyers and elbow pads and helmets and stuff like that, you know, we would go do things like scrounge lumber and nails and just make forts. And our parents didn't even care what we were doing because typically they just wanted to get home from work and have their scotch and soda. That's kind of what went on back then. But nowadays, uh, you know, it, it, the pendulum's kind of swung. So we're encouraging... Uh, I talked to Lacey, probably, the kids probably aren't going to play on the playground structure because it's not done yet, so they'll have to do something weird like play Red Rover or <laughs> steal the bacon or, or Pato Pato Gonzo, which is Duck Duck Goose, something like that anyway. So that's happening. And then on May 12th, we are going to have a newcomer's lunch. So those that have not been to a newcomer's lunch will just spend some time enjoying food and talking a little bit about the history of uh, the Church of Toll House mission in this community, uh, get to know each other a little bit. Yes? Oh, I did change that, and thank you. Yes, I originally planned it for the 12th. Yeah, that's a brain glitch right there. Uh, the 19th, it's May 19th, so let me say that three times, May 19, May 19, May 19, that's when the newcomer's lunch is going to be, because if I kept you behind for a newcomer's lunch on Mother's Day, I would be kind of a jerk. So that's just kind of the reality of it. Um, I think Bible studies are going on this week. Guys, uh, we're still in Hosea on Thursday mornings. We're meeting at 7 again. Monday nights, we are still finishing up uh, the last little bit of Romans, and then after that, we're going to go into Ephesians. Um, I think... The gals on Monday nights are still doing the David Jeremiah book, The Great Disappearance. So, and then is there anything else that I'm missing? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Thursday is the last day of Awana. In fact, you know if, I'll just say it. If, if anybody wants to uh, hang out a little bit after service and stack chairs... That'd be odd, because I heard it's Flores Lava Night, isn't it? Huh? Oh, then never mind. Don't stack chairs. 
that would have been make work, and that would not be good. So, yeah, okay, so it'll be uh, last Awana this Thursday and then Awana Sunday, which means we'll have the opportunity to uh, kind of find out what went on with Awana this year, and maybe we'll have a little clip, and Jay and Nicole will get to recognize some of the people that uh, got to invest uh, their lives into the children of this community, so that'll be a great time. So anything else that we need to make mention of? All right. Before we finish up 1 Corinthians 6, we really are going to finish it up today. But prior to that, um, we're going to catch up a little bit with uh, Robert and Alicia Lawrence, who are in Hermosillo, Mexico. Um, Deanne Mullen is transitioning, or has been for, well, it's going on a couple years, but she's getting to know uh, the different ministry leaders, beginning to build a rapport and, and, and develop um, uh, just a, a bit of a history with each of them. Uh, we had some technological issues, so we're going to show a video this morning. It might be a little bit weird, so I'll just do some cleanup and explanation afterwards. <laughs> and, uh, and Deanne's going to come up first, and she's going to share a little bit, and then I'll, I'll come up and be the closer before we, uh, before we start the message. <laughs> so... <laughs> talking about his friend Joel, and we'll probably meet Joel on the video. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to lay the foundation, he wants to tell us that Joel has been his student for nearly four years now, three years full-time, and now is one of three assistant pastors with me in the church. He just graduated at University of Sonoma in psychology for drug addiction and works at the clinic in the city in addition to his pastoral work. I am also training up another student who, will, who we will ordain in a month or two to pastor our first mission church and plant Calvary Sinai for now. But I pastor both churches. I want to thank you, Toll House, for your continual support and the special gift to cover the entire roof process and even enough to start the floor. It's good to have a floor and a roof, right? <laughs> May the Lord multiply your blessings to us 100 times, both here and in heaven. Alicia and I love you all from Brother Lawrence. Amen. So, let's see how this is going to work. <laughs> Are we ready? I am a great who was music, but we had not beside me, God Almighty. Yes, God, you are. Let's lift our voice and sing. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Come on. Hallelujah. Holy, holy God Almighty. Great I am. Who is worthy? None beside thee. God Almighty. The great I am. Quiero estar más cerca de ti, amando al mundo y odiando al mar. Yo quiero escuchar las voces del cielo cantando un Aleluya, Santo, Santo, Poderoso, Granioso, Eres digno de alabanza, Poderoso, Granioso. Tú eres el Granioso. 
the mountains shake before him, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, 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 come on and do more. It's one of those things. That's called, that's called user error right there. That's what that's called. Anyway, 
Yeah, he was uh, one of my students at the Bible College when Mary Beth and I were dorm mom and dads at Joshua Springs Calvary Chapel. And uh, Robert actually was newly out of prison when he came to the Bible College. He came to know the Lord in prison. And long story short, he's got a book called Useful Junk that if I get some copies, if anybody's interested, I can get you that book. But it, um, it kind of explains what the Lord brought him through to help shape him and train him. Because Robert, uh, if you sit down and talk with him, it's dizzying. Uh, he has... He has such a sharp mind, and actually when I converse with him, I have to look at him and say, Robert, stop talking, I'm going to talk now, because the gears are just going continually, and by the time he got out of prison, he probably had more head knowledge about theology than most PhDs have, but because he'd been institutionalized, he did not play well with others. And so that was uh, the training ground that the Lord had to take him through. Um, and we've stayed connected all these years. They uh, felt a real heart uh, to go to Hermosillo. Uh, and Robert is teaching apologetics, which is defending the faith to Mexican pastors because many pastors are ill-equipped, and especially in Mexico, that they really don't have much to offer more than what those that they are teaching already possess. And so they need to have somebody that comes alongside them and equips them and disciples them. So they have a, a Bible college, and they actually are one of the first Bible colleges in Mexico and the first in Sonora, Mexico, to actually be accredited by the government. And what they do is they do kind of a, a a dual program where it's theology and it's also vocational because it's bivocational for most of the pastors there. Uh, for a lot of years, they were going to churches that were in Hermosillo, which is about 30 minutes from where they're at, but they noticed that those that were local that didn't have access to vehicles, they couldn't go to Hermosillo, so they planted a church. Uh, Robert has been training two guys. One of them is Joel, that. Uh, Deanne made mention of, uh, training actually to take over the church. Because Robert will be honest, uh, Robert is, uh, he's not a shepherd. It's just not the way that he's shaped. And so he wants to mentor some Mexican pastors there also because, you know, you, you want to you wanna minister people from there to actually be the shepherds of the flock. So he's doing that, and then they're doing another church plant also in another community. So... Um, grateful that we get to partner with him, both financially but also prayerfully. So um, we're incredibly blessed. We are. And this little tiny church has the opportunity to be a contributor with so many different ministries all over the world. It's pretty awesome. So, well, let's pray, huh? Father, just a, a simple truth to revisit this morning. If Jesus be lifted up, then he will draw all men unto himself. All types of folks from different cultures, from different socioeconomic levels, different cultural traditions, uh, different life experiences, that Jesus, you are the great unifier. Jesus, you are the one that you <laughs> provoked the Apostle Paul to write, the very spirit of the living God, uh, that was fulfilled in the reality of God's plan and purpose through you, the only begotten Son, that that, that inspiration provoked the Apostle Paul to, to share what we get to enjoy, that you destroy the dividing wall of hostility between us and you, God, and, and, and each other, that we don't have to walk in fear and suspicion or paranoia because it's an, evil, that it's, it's an even playing field, that the gospel is an even playing field, that the reality of the human condition is that uh, we are all completely lost apart from you, but every single one of us can be found in you, and we are so very grateful for that. We praise you in, in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to springboard off of um, what I encouraged everybody with before we had our greeting. Paul's words, right? 
Do you not know that your body is the temple of God, a temple of the Holy Spirit, a place of divine manifestation? Think on that for a second. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a place of divine manifestation where God can be clearly observed and experienced. As long as we're receiving the right information at the time. As long as we haven't been detoured into the wrong information and get to enjoy the right information, then we become a source of his inspiration. Sanctuary. You and I are sanctuaries where God resides. That scripture that I shared, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. This was God's preordained, prescribed plan before recorded history. That uh, it goes on in, in 91 and 2. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That, that word everlasting, I share it a lot. It's one of my favorite words. It means beyond the vanishing point. It means if you're going to look at it from a practical, rubber meets the road, living on this planet kind of uh, perspective, that you're looking out, and when you see the horizon, you know, you can't see past the horizon, right? Well, what this word everlasting means is that the reality of God and who he is is beyond the horizon. It's beyond our ability to be able to comprehend, which speaks to, of course, the love and acceptance that he has for us, that it is also beyond what we can comprehend, what we can wrap our minds around. So before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Home, asylum, refuge. We're uh, plagued by 24-hour news. Yes, I meant to say plagued. Um, but we understand the concept of refugee. We see war-torn c- countries, and we see that people need places of asylum to escape the horrors of war. And that's why I shared what I shared this morning, that the reality is is that God is the only reliable escape from this war zone. Of course, the enemy is vigilant and diligent to confuse and to frustrate and to attempt to blind us from that reality. That's where we have to fight the good fight of faith. God's our escape from war. It's, uh, he's our shelter. He's our support. Jesus spoke in John chapter 15. We spoke about verse 14 last week, but if we jump up to verse 4, it's an evangelistic passage. It, it, it's the opportunity to step into the reality that God originally intended. He said, abide in me. Okay. It means live. That's what abide means. It means live. Live in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. See, God desires that we produce something. We're going to produce according to what we're receiving. The enemy wants us to receive that which is corrupt. The Father You know, like we talked about in Jesus' passage to the disciples, he says, the flesh profits nothing. So my drives, desires, and inclinations, if they're being influenced by the pattern of this world, which is dependent upon lust, it's not profitable. But he said, Jesus says, the the words I give are spirit and life. So live in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, So neither can you unless you abide in me. 
So, so many different ways, through so many different descriptions, through so many different illustrations. This is the reality of the gospel. God is saying, this is the reality I intended for you, and I will give you the opportunity to step into it. I will do it. I will do what is necessary for you to step into this reality. You just need to receive and respond to it. Live in me, and I live in you. Again, that's the idea of, um, well, it's the fundamental human desire that we all have, right? I've talked about it many times. We all want to feel like we're significant. We all want to feel like we belong. We all want to feel like we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. We all want to feel like we're contributing. And we're miserable when we don't. Well, well, God wants us (laughs) to not be miserable. (laughs) It's a simple statement, but it's true. Um, and, And get excited about this statement. God has made his home within us to express his life through us. Let me say it again. God has made his home within us to express his life through us. And we won't be happy with any other alternative. Genesis 32, um, go there and read it on your own. Revisit it. If you haven't read it before, then read it. God offered Jacob a new reality to step into. Jacob had been receiving information to navigate this life from corrupted information sources. He had estrangement from his brother. There was choices that he made that contributed to the estrangement with his brother. He came to learn after they had been disconnected for a long time that he was going to confront his brother again. Fear was influencing his thought processes. All of us in this room probably have had a moment like that. Fear is informing our thought processes. Paranoia and suspicion is triggering us. And we are spending all our time trying to figure out ways out of our own intellect, our own strength, our own finesse, our own tenacity. We're trying to figure out how to circumvent it or change it or get rid of it or or whatever it is. And sometimes God has met us there. He's met me there a few times, more than a few times, if I'm going to be honest. So we have this reality in Genesis 32 where there's the angel of the Lord, and Jacob has this wrestling match with him. I personally believe that the angel of the Lord in this chapter is what's called a a Christophany or a theophany, that it's it's an an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament before his incarnation. In their wrestling, and sweat, and oh, just an exertion of so much strength, and Jacob thinks he's going to prevail over this angel. It's like a a metaphor for our struggles in life. It's like we just, we got to prove ourselves. We got to, you know, it's even though, we might get a glimpse of the reality that God does not want us to merit his love, that God doesn't want, to want us to prove ourselves to him. He just wants us to receive that which he will willingly gift to us. But we live in this world that's all about production and all about performance. And so we're, we're even fighting with God when God is trying to communicate with us to let go and stop trying to figure this out and just receive and so there's Jacob, and he's, he's wrestling, and then I'm going to say God reaches over and touches his hip and shrivels that muscle up. He doesn't have a chance. He thought he was winning. Sometimes we think we're winning with God. Sometimes we gravitate towards some kind of theology where it's like, okay, I'll acknowledge you, God, and then I want you to rubber stamp all the things that I want to do in life. And it's like, nope. That ain't going to happen. You think that's going to make you happy. It, it's... It's kind of like what we say about kids. You don't even really know what you want. We adults are in the same boat. 
And that's why God has to intervene sometimes. The way that this ends up is beautiful. Because God has a conversation with Jacob and says, I'm, I'm going to call you Israel. Now, Israel can mean wrestles with God, but it also means God prevails. And what he says to him, he says, because you have grappled, you have wrestled with God and man, and you have prevailed. But you know how he prevailed? Because he gave up and he said, bless me. I can't do this. Bless me. He, he began receiving. He, he could receive. He wasn't hardened to it anymore. That's, that's the opportunity that, that God gives every single one of us. Quick review. We talked about terrorists. You know, uh, Satan, the adversary, devil, slanderer. 21, 22 different names that describe the character of the opposing spiritual influence that we have around us. He's, uh, there's, a, there's a hierarchy that's Satan and the fallen angels, the demonic influence that is existing in a realm that we can't see but nonetheless is very real. They're terrorists. That's what they are. Dark spiritual principalities and powers of this world that come at us basically with one of two things. And uh, Paul speaks to them a lot. One is false teaching, which is taking the truth of God and corrupting it, adding something to it, or, or taking away from the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that happens in so many different ways. And then what he's finishing up in this passage in Corinth, um, temptation. Uh, we struggle with both. I, I think more often we probably struggle with temptation more than we... Nah, I don't even know if I could say that. I'll have to... Because they could actually cloverleaf and overlap. So I'll have, to, I'll have to think on that. But what we're dealing with is we're dealing with predatory spirits that they prey on fear, they prey on insecurity, and pressure to produce. And what they actually produce in the midst of using smoke and mirrors and misdirection and, and emphasizing things that trigger fear in all of us, uh, they, they trigger this sense of unfulfillment, unfulfilled longing, that um, we're going to struggle with thinking that something's being withheld from us, which is a lie from the pit of hell, because Paul and clearly describing the substance of the gospel in his epistles and writings, he says that we've been given everything that we need for a life of holiness and godliness. To, to live in this reality that God has offered us. Just got to listen. We got to continually listen and help each other listen. So before we finish the last four verses in chapter 6 of Corinth, I want to go to a, just a passage in another one of Paul's writings in the book of Romans. And I'm just going to cover verses 16 and 19. He's giving them a commendation that will be complementary to the reality of the correction that he's going to give the Corinthians. The Corinthians are dealing with normalized cultural practices that if the people engage in them, they're, 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 they're commonly participated in, normalized practices that if the people who have received Christ participate in, then it's going to open them up to corrupting influences. It's going to stifle their progress. It's going to disturb their souls and their psyches. It's going to be soul-damaging. And not only will it be damaging to them, but it'll be damaging to the church, it'll be damaging to their marriages, it'll be damaging to their families. And so Paul, of course, having the heart that God has given him, you know, he spent a year and a half in this church, it's probably spent a longer chunk of time there than any other place. He's got a lot invested. He's, he's spiritually birthed a lot of people in that area. And so he's concerned for their safety. He wants to give them uh, preventative warnings, but he also wants to protect them so that they can prosper. Because if they prosper, 
then the people around them are, are going to prosper too. So he says in Romans uh, 16, 19, and 20, he says, For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Doesn't mean that they were perfect, but the reality is, is that the Roman church was a light in the region at that time. That there was the reality of the transformation of the power of the Holy Spirit and a lot of people within that church because they were trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Obedience, this, is, this, should, not, this should not be a scary word to any of us. Okay? We hear obey, maybe we see the, you know, the skate t-shirts that were out 10 years ago that say obey or whatever else, but obey takes on that idea of you will do what I tell you to do, you will obey. That, that's not the Father. Okay? When it's talking about obedience in the scriptures, we need to consider the Father's heart and what it means to obey is to have sensitive, responsive listening. Consider the person in the heart of God. Consider what his plan and purpose was before recorded history. Consider simple statements like Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That even before I became a zygote, that even prior to that God had provided a salvation plan knowing that I would be affected by the curse of sin in this world and that he already had a plan that had been developed for me to step into and you step into. Predestination is not a scary word, but we've turned it into something that it's not. It's not, you'll hear me say it a lot because I, I really hate that what is promoted is this individual selection kind of thing. All predestination is, is that God preordained a plan before recorded history that anybody who would receive Christ could become a child of God, whether Jew or Gentile. It's that simple. The only way that you can believe beyond that, you have to be conditioned by a certain perspective in order to believe that way. And then, if you do start believing that way, it, it's a prescription for apathy and arrogance. That, that's what it is. It's, then we don't get to fully grow and enjoy. I'm a sanctuary. You're, you're a sanctuary. Wherever we go, we're, we're a sanctuary where people can experience divine manifestation. You know, these sound like really fancy, religious, even kind of weird, awkward words, but they're not. I, I can have an encounter, a conversation with somebody where, where God is, is, is clearly observed and understood. That, it's, it's that simple. It, it really is. And so he says... For the report of your obedience has reached all, therefore I'm rejoicing. Remember, rejoice means delighting in God's grace. That he's, he's, he's delighting in the transformative work that's gone on in the lives of many of the people in the Roman church because they stopped believing according to the patterns of thinking of this sin-stained and cursed world and began listening to the reality of God. And they're growing in it. He says, but I want you to be wise. Wise means, uh, it means skillful. That's, that's what it means. So let me read it all together and it, it'll, it, it'll give us a clear picture of what it means. It says, um, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. You know what, what good is? It's what God's gifted us with. When it says good, it means inherently good. It means he who knew no sin became sin for us that we would be the righteousness of God. God has gifted me, imparted his goodness to me. You know, my, my works apart from God are filthy rags, right? That's what it says in the Old Testament. But, you know, there's nothing wrong. Maybe it sounds a little bit trite, but when somebody says, hey, how you doing? You can say, I'm good. I'm good. You want to know why I'm good? Because God imparted his goodness to me. He gifted me his goodness. And so he wants me to be skillful in what is inherently good. 
to grow in the depth and the understanding of what he has gifted me. And then he wants me to be innocent in what is evil. And, and a simple way to, to explain that is protected from what is poisonous, neutralizing, and paralyzing. Which it means mingled. It's when we, we take um, cultural practices and we mingle them with religion. It's, uh, it, it's the old story from years ago. It, it's, it's a little bit crass and gross, but I'll tell it anyways. Um, a, a dad bakes brownies for his kids right? And he brings the brownies out. He says, you, wanna, you want these brownies? Of course we want these brownies. What if, what if I told you that in the batter was 1% poop? They wouldn't want the brownies, right? Well, I mean, it's kind of a picture of the reality when we mingle the cultural practices of this world with what is the unadulterated pure truth from the gospel, then it poisons us a little bit. Sometimes it's going to take a long time before that poison builds up, you know. And, and thank God that he's, he's provided for that, too. He's, again, he's provided everything that I need. Even if it means I've been chewing on some poop brownies for a while and I need to stop, maybe start eating some broccoli, you know. <clears throat> So he wants them to have protection and prevention from commonly accepted, normalized, well, antichrist spirit that's all around. That's, he doesn't want us to become prisoners of war. That, that's what happens. He's dwelling place. He's our escape from the war zone. If I'm listening in and beginning to believe in faulty information... I become a prisoner of war. He didn't want me to be a prisoner of war. We need to remember, springboarding off of what we said last week, the intimacy and the longing that we're looking for is never satisfied by the immoral. Okay, it's, it's what Scripture says, which means it's what God says, and it's also, unfortunately, what we learn by experience at times. There's nothing satisfying there for us. So picking up in the last few verses of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, and remember in Corinth, what was commonly practiced was that they had these pagan temples and part of their worship practices was to utilize temple prostitutes. And it was promoted in such a way that there was nothing wrong with it. And so I shared last week that they had kind of a saying there, well, food is for the body and body's for food, you know, it's like they, they understood that, you know, just because at these temples there's food sacrificed to idols, well, we know those idols aren't real, that they're not gods, and, and so, hey, it's okay, and Paul even says in another passage of Scripture, you know, don't let your conscience be corrupted because you find out that you're eating a piece of meat or something and somebody had sacrificed it to an idol. It's not an idol to you. You know that there's one true God. But then they would use that as a justification and springboard for it, of it and say, well, it, just like food's for the body and the body's for food, well, body needs sex and sex is for the body. And so the cultural accepted normalized practice was there's nothing wrong with doing that except that we understand that, that oneness, that kind of intimacy is a gift that's reserved just for our marriage partner. And ultimately, that marriage partner is a picture of this marriage partner. And Paul says it in this passage. We are joined to God. We are one spirit with him. Let's look at that relationally and positively and not punitively. It's not, oh, I'm one spirit with him and I'm joined to him. And, oh, I looked at something that I shouldn't have looked at or I did this or I did that. Instead of allowing the enemy to have that foothold, why not just repent and say, I just need to stop it because there's nothing here for me. This is miserable. This is, this is not going to help develop intimacy in my marriage, in my family, in my relationship with the Father. He always wants what is best for me. And he wants me to step into what is best and then have vulnerable, transparent, real relationships around me that are going to help me stay in what is best 
And then I'm going to be mindful to give away what is best, right? 16 or 17 and 18. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee. Flee immorality. You know what immorality is? It's pornea. It's where we get pornography from. It, it, it means a, a distortion of what God originally intended. That's really what it means. And, and it means a sell-off. It, it means to prostitute oneself. And, and I'm not saying that so everybody will feel, oh, ooh, icky. I don't want anybody to feel icky in church, but it's a reality of, of, of what the word means. It's the enemy's perverted way to get us to pay for acceptance which we already own. We already, we, that's why we got to remind each other. You know, like I've told you guys before, I drop my kids off in the morning, Aubrey Elementary, every day I tell them the same thing. Remember who you are and don't try, don't strive to get what you already own. Father's saying that to us in, in so many different ways. You actually have direct, unobstructed, unhindered, access to the intimacy that you've always longed for as you share relationship with me and share relationship with other people. And don't let the liar, the slanderer, the diabolical one, don't, don't let him pervert that which is pure, that, that which is good. And I'll say this over and over again because I've struggled in these areas before. I don't want anybody in this room to feel condemned because I'm sharing a difficult passage of Scripture. I want you to know that there's many men in this room and women that have struggled in these areas. And, and I need help, and I've needed help, and, and we all need help. And so, as I said many weeks ago, let's be that safe place that sanctuary where people can get respite, where people can get recovery, where people can get loving correction. Let's be that place of sanctuary and respite that people can come to so that they won't isolate themselves and estrange themselves because they're so preoccupied with being judged and condemned that they, they don't feel like they have any recourse. They don't have any place to go. Oh. Know that you can come and talk to me. And there's other people in here I know that you can come talk to, too. And that we'll lock arms, and then we'll listen to the reality of the power of God's word to help us stay in the reality that God has intended. Oh. He goes on to say, Paul says back in verse 18, every other sin that a man commits outside is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. It, it's, I'm inviting enemy invasion by making the choice. It's, it's like, I'm choosing to eat the brownie. I, I'm choosing to consume the poison. Doesn't mean that God's going to leave me. Doesn't mean that he's going to forsake me. It doesn't mean that he's going to be disgusted in me. It doesn't mean that he's going to go tell me that, you know what, you're not qualified to, to be able to share love and light with anybody. It doesn't mean any of those things. What it means, though, is that it's going to make us vulnerable to the enemy establishing a stronghold in our life. And a stronghold is a, a false argument in which someone seeks shelter. That's, that's what a stronghold is. But what does scripture say about strongholds? It says the weapons of our warfare are not of this world. But they're spiritual. And they're able to tear down satanic strongholds in anything that sets itself up in pretense of God. And that's what the enemy is trying to do in our lives. This will be just as fulfilling as God or more fulfilling. I'm, I'm on the phone. I'm, I'm, I'm calling Leo. I'm, I'm calling Randy. I'm going to call somebody and say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with right now. You know, let's go to war together. That's, that, that's the blessing that we have with community. We can go to war together. So. So when we, when we choose to take the bait, it's a transaction that disturbs our conscience, undercuts our confidence. 
We share in Christ's death, his life, his victory, his righteousness, and his glory. It's futile, soul-damaging, and fraught with destructive consequences to seek fulfillment in the commonly accepted sin patterns of this world, the pattern that we were purchased out of. Last passage right here. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Spoke a lot about that. Who is in you, whom you have from God, you're not your own. This is reality right now. In this world, we're either a son of Adam or a son of Christ. That's what's so awesome about the gospel. Because once you receive Christ, you're not any of this anymore. You're not a son of Adam anymore. You're you're a son of Jesus Christ. We're either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. So I've been purchased out of this. I'm no longer a slave of sin. Uh, According to the scriptures, I am now the righteousness of God in Christ. So the enemy is going to be vigilant and diligent to try to convince me otherwise. But this is what God has already established. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. He can't take that away from me. Because God gave his goodness to me and to you. Verse 20, you've been bought with a price. That's a beautiful statement because it speaks to the reality that there's been a value that's been assigned to me and you. And the devil's trying to put us on the discount shelf. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to put us on the clearance rack. And God said, no, no, this is what you're worth. You're worth my son. You are worth my son. And even, even though even though Satan will bastardize that truth with all kinds of different misdirection and smoke and mirrors or whatever else, no matter what he says, this is the value that I've placed on you. Be who you're worth. Get help to be who you're worth. Not in an arrogant way, because what have we received that has not been given to us? Closing it out. We'll, we'll book in with another Romans passage. Romans 15, Paul says, do not be deceived. That means don't wander from the healthy healing path that I've established. That, that, that's what it means. And he says, bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company means... Contact, conversation, communion. Keeping yourself in an atmosphere where you're receiving constantly corrupted information. It doesn't mean that you decide, those are bad people, I'm going to stay away from them. It, don't, don't get sucked into the us-them mentality. Those people over there Only reason why I'm not one of those people over there is because Jesus made me a we people now, okay? And that's the same opportunity that's available to anybody and everybody. There is never an excuse for arrogance in the body of Christ. Jesus was God in human flesh, and he cleaned camel poop out of people's toes. There is no excuse for arrogance, in the body of Christ. He did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And now we're called little Christs. That's what we're called now. We need to to really break this down because when it says corrupt good morals... Good means redemptively useful. That's that's what it means. Redemptively, influential toward, oh, the vine and the vine dresser, I abide in the vine, I, I live in Christ and he lives in me, and then I bear, oh, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, self control, not paranoia, not 
fretting, not freaking out, not, you know. Again, redemptively useful, influential toward fruit-bearing freedom. And then what are morals? That, that's God's intended productive pattern for life. Again, abide in me, I'll abide in you. Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord through, through Jacob, the history of the patriarchs, whom eventually the Christ would come, comes through that lineage, no longer of the tribe of Levi because new covenant, new covenant had to come from Judah, not from Levi. But just as God looked at Israel and said, I no longer call you Jacob, which means deceiver, which means that his actions were being provoked by a world of deception. That's us too. That's, that's what we're contending against. But he's speaking to each one of us also. And he's saying that you have grappled with God and with man and you have prevailed. Why have you prevailed? Bless me. Bless me. I have nothing apart from you. And I, I want to unclench this white knuckle grip on this thing that the enemy's been lying to me about that says if you give this up, you're going to give up any source of, of, of security in your life. I've gone, gotten so used to using this in order to survive life, whatever it is. And he's saying, let it go. Just receive. And just, just bless me. And then, oh gosh, together. Man. Just, we'll just live our lives as a sanctuary where God presides. Isn't that awesome? All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for... Gosh, there's just so much stuff. There's just so much substance in these passages of Scripture. And, and um, we just admit that we need you, Lord God. There's never going to be this spiritual plateau that we get to. There, there's never going to be this place, Lord God. Our one defense, our righteousness, is God, we, we need you. And thank you that you tell us in your word that if we ask you, our Father, for a fish, you're not going to give us a serpent. If we ask you for an egg, you're not going to give us a, a scorpion. That you like to give good gifts to your children. And the gift that we've wanted more than anything else, Lord, is your Holy Spirit. And, and that's what you long to give anybody and everybody that receives. So, Father, I ask this day that you would uh, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, that we would enjoy the security of what your word says. Hey, if we live by the Spirit, which is, which is how we live, it's, uh, it's not just a prescriptive statement, it's a descriptive statement. If, if, if you live by the Spirit, then, then walk by the Spirit. It's, it's just the way that you've designed life to happen. And so help us to camp there, Lord God. Help us to camp there knowing that you are our dwelling place in all generations. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You all have a great Sunday. Um, if you don't know if you're a sanctuary where God resides, if you want to know today, come and talk to me. Or talk to somebody in here that you trust. I, I would love to have the opportunity to spend some time with you so that you can walk out here with confidence and security that you are a sanctuary where God resides. If you need prayer for any other reason, as we talked about last week, we want this to be a safe place where ministry can take place. You can stay here as long as you want. If you've got a word of encouragement for somebody... Uh, if, if the Holy Spirit just pressed something on you and, you know, the, the, the New Testament definition of what prophecy is, that's to exhort and to console and to encourage. And so if, if you have a word for somebody, don't leave today without giving it to them, all right? Because this is, this is supposed to be an all play. That's what it's supposed to be. Love you guys.